that. So that's the title of my sermon tonight. The title of my sermon is Basing Your Beliefs on the Bible. Basing Your Beliefs on the Bible. And I just wanted to remind us today that the Bible is in this church as well, as well as should be in our personal lives. It is the final authority of all matters of faith and practice. And we need to make, make sure when we believe something that it is based on the Bible. Right? That's, that's why we believe anything. We have the Word of God and we need to base what we believe on the Word of God. And I want to just talk about that. I want to talk about ways people don't base their belief on the Bible and, and show you some wrong ways that people base their beliefs. But why do we base everything we believe on the Bible? In 2 Timothy 3 it says here, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So that's the topic here, right? The holy scriptures, which is what the Bible is. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So it's not some scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is why we have to take all scripture into account. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all scripture is profitable. I've already talked about this before, but it's all profitable to us. That's why all needs to be taken into account. It all can be used to get sound doctrine. And it says here it's profitable for doctrine. And I've told you this, guys, before. I think a great way to think about this is it's telling you what's right, the doctrine. It's telling you what's wrong, the reproof. It's for correction, so it's telling you how to make what is wrong right, and then it's for instruction in righteousness, how to keep it right. That's, that's, that really much encompasses the Christian life, doesn't it? What's right, what's wrong, how to make what's wrong right, how to keep it right. That the man of God may be perfect, and this is why we believe we have all scripture. There's not going to be another revelation of the word of God that we don't know about because we have it all here. It says all scripture and it says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. See, if we don't have all the scripture, then how can we do all good works? How can the man of God be perfect if we don't have all scripture? So all scripture is here. This is why it says in 1 Peter 3, I believe, of 1 Peter 1 in verse 3, it says he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So in this church, you know, we believe the King James Bible. We believe the King James Bible is the word of God. That's why the King James Bible in English to our English speaking church is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And there is actually a difference. It's not just that we're trying to be old fashioned or we like how Shakespeare sounds. The reason why we believe the King James Bible is because it's accurate. It's based on the right manuscripts. It's an accurate translation, or I would say a perfect translation in English, and that's why we use it. And people will say, you know, well, we, we, it's so old-fashioned, it's got the these and the thous, but the these and the thous are there for a reason. They actually mean something. You can't just take another Bible translation and just say, oh, let's just get rid of the these and the thous, because you're losing meaning, right? Thee and thou is singular. Ye and you is plural. You can't just get rid of these words. That's why they exist. That's why they wrote when they translated the King James Bible. They wrote it in a language that they didn't actually speak because it maintained those meanings. So there's more to why we use the King James Bible than just a tradition that's being passed down. So the Word of God, it has everything we need to know about all good works. And that's why we base everything we believe on the Word of God. And it's not only basing what we believe on the Word of God, but the Bible says we live by every Word of God. And Jesus answered him and said, uh, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And what's interesting is that the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Word of God. Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, how does that work mechanically? I don't really know. That's why the Bible says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And yet that God was manifest in the flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. Yet at the same time, that Word that became flesh is the Word of God, is the Word that we are reading. Now, how does that work? I don't know. But somehow... Not the paper, not the ink, not the book that you're holding or the tablet that you're using. Those words 
not even in a particular language, you know, because it can be translated from this language. Somehow that word is God. There's a living word, and that's what saves us. It's the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And that's why the word of God's the head of the church, because they're one and the same thing. The word was God. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You know, there's even a, a passage in the Bible, it's not in my notes, but it's like it says, he's magnified his word above all his name, right? So it's like even the word is magnified above the name of the Lord, but it's the, at the same time, it's the same thing as well, because the word was God. So we don't always know how all that mechanics works, and this is why there's always this controversy about the Trinity, right? People always argue about how it works because it, it's a mystery about how God works, the inner workings of the Godhead, how the Godhead became flesh, and how that all works. People talk about these things. Um, so Jesus is the head of the church. That's why this church bases everything we believe on the Bible. We have to live by every word of the Bible. We ought to base everything we believe on the Bible. That's why we say the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So just not, not just what we believe, but also what we do. We base on the Bible. Remember, we're talking about basing your beliefs on the Bible. Now, that means everything we do must align with the Bible, right? When you say, I'm going to base my beliefs on the Bible, everything I do lines up with the Bible. Now, what it doesn't mean is everything I do is mentioned in the Bible, right? Because there are some things we do that aren't mentioned in the Bible because there's an element of liberty where if it's not mentioned, then that, that's a matter of the conscience. It's a matter of preference and things like that. But what it does mean if I'm basing my beliefs on the Bible is if, it, if I'm doing something that is contrary to the Bible, that has to change, yep. right? If I'm basing what I believe in all matters of faith and practice on the Bible, if I'm doing something contrary to the Bible, then that has to change. That's what it means when we base our beliefs on the Bible. So beliefs are based on all scripture, like we read. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the assumption that we build our thinking on as believers is that the word is perfect. Right? The word is perfect, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Uh, and because it's perfect, it doesn't contradict Right? That's why we, the, the word doesn't contradict, because it's from a perfect God, it shouldn't contradict, therefore it must all harmonize, right? It must all fit together. It has to be perfect. If there can't be contradictory statements in the Bible, and this is how we understand the word of God. Now in Acts 17.11, the Bible says here, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So you see here, that's why they were more noble, because they didn't just receive the preaching, they didn't just hear something preached and just believed it just based on the preaching. They searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Why? Because they're basing what they believe on the Bible, not just on what they've heard from somebody else. The Bible says here in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. So S-H-A-E-W, I just want to stop here, because that's pronounced show, all right, guys? Because <laughs> people always pronounce it shoe, it's not pronounced shoe, right? It's just an old spelling of how to, how to pronounce show. So study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what does it mean to rightly divide the truth, right? It's not like a dispensationalist when he just like chops it up into different things and they just have nothing to do with each other because we have different sections in the Bible, right? We have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament. What it means to rightly divide is we need to have these principles to know that two things don't always go together. But as a whole, the Bible still needs to fit together. It still needs to harmonize because it's all from one God. So it all needs to be understood. But there are principles within the Bible where we understand, hey, there is a New Testament, there is an Old Testament. And, right, and what you have to understand about New Testament and Old Testament as well, it's not just the books. Because you have people think, okay, there's New Testament and Old Testament, which is books written before Jesus and then books written after Jesus. It's one way to refer to New Testament, Old Testament. Then there's the New Testament versus Old Testament timeline where 
when you're reading the Gospels, you're actually still reading in a time when the Old Testament is still in effect because the Old Testament didn't end until Jesus died and rose again. And then when you read the book of Acts or at the, near the end of the Gospels is where the New Testament covenant and timeline actually begins. So then you've got to keep, think, keep that in mind. And then when we're talking about laws, there's a difference between New Testament ordinances and Old Testament ordinances. And this is where people can go wrong as well. And this is where you have you know, people like the Mormons, right, and the Catholics, where they're still sort of copying the Levitical priesthood. They're copying these Old Testament ordinances by having all these special robes and a holy place. And even Mormons, you know, have, they have those secret ritual temples where they have, I don't know, a secret handshake or they go through the curtain and everything. So they're trying to get all this. And, you know, they, they talk about the Aaronic priest and they haven't they're not rightly dividing the word of truth because they're still applying things that don't apply anymore like and same with seventh day adventists you know applying the sabbath this is what it means to rightly divide the truth word of truth to know what is applicable what isn't applicable another one is like the blessings and cursings that's another thing that people get mixed up where they talk about god's going to curse you for disobedience and you think well but nobody's fully disobedient so are we all cursed no so it's like what's because you're not rightly dividing you know the old covenant from the new covenant another principle we talk about is statements and stories so statements are very important they 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 will interpret stories if the stories are wrong based on new testament versus old testament so there's these principles to put into play but ultimately we still get those principles from the word of god you know i mean i'm not i'm not it's not like we're making up these principles from nowhere no, we get we know the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant why because we learn it in hebrews we're taught about these things. So ultimately, it still comes back down to searching the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. This is where we get these different principles and we get these different commandments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And all this together helps determine sound doctrine. So that's how we ought to build our beliefs. Right? That's the right way to build our beliefs. We base our beliefs on the Bible. We take all scripture into account and then there will be a position that is consistent across all scripture taking into account rightly dividing old testament new testament statements stories all these sorts of things and it should all come together because it's a book from a perfect all-knowing god it's his word it's not bound by time it's not like there's mistakes because isaiah didn't know what matthew was writing no that there's it all holy men of god spake as they were moved by the holy ghost so what are some bad basis for beliefs how do you know when you're not basing what you believe on the Bible. Well, let's, let's go through a couple of bad bases for beliefs, right? Because the what we should be basing everything we believe on is the Word of God, is the Bible. But there are some things that people base their beliefs on that are not the Bible, but they think they're basing their beliefs on the Bible. They think, you know, this is a you know a Christian doctrine or this is something that the Bible teaches, but when you actually pin them down, it is actually something that they're basing on the Bible. So here's a couple of ones. Number one is a foreign language, right? Basing something you believe on a language that you don't speak, that nobody speaks, that nobody knows. And this is what happens in a lot of churches, right? People going back to the Greek, going back to the Hebrew. Somebody went back to the Hebrew recently, right? And it was a bit shocking. Um, so going back to the Hebrew. Now, one example, um, one example of people going back to the Greek, and it, you know, people going back to you know, Elohim in the Old Testament is one example. But the, the one example you'll, look, you'll, you'll find when people go back to the Greek is they always try and compare agape and phileo. Right? And they say, they say that you know, uh, they didn't translate the Bible right because agape is like this you know, sacrificial you know, love and then phileo is like this friendly love. And they'll, they'll take you to a passage like John 21 verse 15 so it says so when they had dined so this is when jesus talks to simon again but this is this is where they get these kind of like they're trying to get these little nuggets from the greek right so when they had dined jesus saith to simon peter simon son of jonas lovest so that's agape right uh the, the greek where they say thou lovest thou me more than these he saith unto him yea lord thou knowest that i love thee and then in the greek that's phileo and they love thee he saith unto him feed my lambs so the argument here is that in Greek, agape is like this selfless, unconditional love. And then phileo is just like this brotherly, friendly love. And says, so he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest agape thou me. He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest phileo thou me. So they sort of say like, oh, I wonder why Jesus said agape, agape, phileo. But then Peter's saying phileo, phileo, phileo. 
Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me, Phileo? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love Phileo thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So this is like a textbook example of how people are trying to find a difference of meaning in a foreign language that is not apparent in the English language. So what all that does is that that gets people to doubt what they're reading in their English Bible. So what they're trying to say here is they'll say, oh, well, Jesus is saying, well, do you agape me? Do you agape me? And then the reason why uh, Simon is upset the third time is because he acknowledges, no, you only phileo me. You don't actually agape me unconditionally. But it doesn't even make sense to what is it even being said here because why would the Bible say, he saith unto him the third time? If he's only said phileo the first time, right? Because he's saying agape, agape, phileo. Why would the Bible say he said unto him the third time, do you love me? When it's like, no, you actually said this the first time because the other two times you said something else. And we don't even have to get, we don't have to go back to the Greek to figure out why Peter was upset. It's not that he changed from agape, agape to phileo. It says because he asked him the third time. The, the logical thing would be because he denied him three times and now Jesus is asking him three times, and that's why he said, we don't have to guess, because that's what it says. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me. So they're trying to go back to another language to base a teaching, and all it does is get you to doubt your, your Bible. You know, you read it, and you just don't know, well, do I know what it means now? Because if I go to a foreign language, it's going to mean something else. And when people do these sorts of things, you've got to ask the question, you know, you're looking into a dictionary today, looking at agape, looking at phileo, looking at the definitions, and you kind of think, but, but do you know better than the translators of the King James Bible? And these, these are men that knew multiple languages, like fluent in multiple languages, 48 of them, you know, I don't even know the full number, it's like 48 or 50 of them translating the Bible, you know, all cross-referencing each other and things like that. They come to an agreement that that is the right word. And then we come along hundreds of years later, know one language, have a dictionary with us, you know, and then think we're going to correct what they did. You know, obviously they knew what you knew and more because they were fluent in more languages. So why did they make that choice, right? And, you know, this may be, you know, you may speak Greek and say, hey, well, there is a difference between agape and phileo, right? Yeah, but just because it's used like that today, that doesn't mean it was used like that 2,000 years ago. I mean, think about how English works just across countries. Right? What we mean by something and what they mean by something. And a lot of people think that if it wasn't for the internet and open communications, our languages would be even more different. It's almost like when we got mass communications and people can now communicate across global communication, it kind of put a stop on how much it changes because now you're communicating with people across the world and it kind of puts everyone back together on the same language if we're all speaking English. It doesn't differ as much as it would before, but even before we had mass communications, you know, think about the different English that's spoken in America and England and here and other places. So, What's going to happen after 2,000 years, right? When we're reading a Greek from 2,000 years ago and then reading Greek today, of course there's going to be some changes. So it's not as simple as that, as just writing things off just because, well, today that's what it means. Well, is that what it always means? Did, did the King James translators not know that? Obviously they knew that. And you kind of think as well, if it's wrong, if people believe it's wrong and they keep correcting the King James Bible, why don't you just write a new translation? You know what I mean? If, you, if, they, if people believe so much that the King James Bible is wrongly translated, why don't they have the boldness to stand on it and actually write a new one and say, you know, some people do that, but don't just use the King James Bible and keep correcting it, and then people in the church can't even trust the book that they read anymore. And this is why I got really frustrated once in, in youth group, because I went to a church that go, went back to the Greek, and they believed that, you know, the Bible, the King James Bible is just the best we had in the English language, and I remember in a youth group once, I was so frustrated because, you know, when you, when you sit in a youth group and you, go, you, know, you whole go around the circle and, and we're, we're, we're fine, you know, going through a passage with a fine tooth comb, you know, analyzing every word. And I remember, I remember what happened. I was in this, in this youth group. We were talking about every single word. Oh, what does God mean by that? What does God mean by this? And then the youth group leader said something like, well, it's just the best we have in English anyway. So then it's like, what is it about? I'm just like thinking... Why did we just spend all this time like combing through every single word if these words aren't even the right words? Like, get me the right words then. I was just so frustrated because it's like, why, why 
Why do we treat it and preach it like it's the word of God, but when push comes to shove, it's not the word of God. It's just the best we have. And actually to get the real word of God, we've got to go to a foreign language. So that was really frustrating because I'm like, why am I wasting my time studying this if I don't even believe it? I don't even believe it's accurate. So it can't, if, it, if, it can't, if, if the Bible can't be tran translated, you know, because a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, you've got to go back to a foreign language because there, there are just some words. You know, people will say this. There are just some words that you just can't describe in English. But you know what's always funny about that is they'll say things like that. Like I speak to people that speak Chinese and my dad will say things like this. He'll say, you know, it, it just doesn't have this the same meaning in English. And then he goes on to explain what that word means in English. So it's just like, I don't get it. I, I thought you said it couldn't be described in English, but then you say this word means this in English. So do, do, do you get what I'm saying? Like if it's impossible, if they say it can't be translated, and then they explain you the word in English, that means it can be translated. And if a word can't be translated to English, how is an English speaking person meant to learn a foreign language? Because obviously when you learn a foreign language, it needs to be translated into your language first for you to learn that language. But if it's just these, there are these words that can never be understood by anyone that doesn't speak that language, how does anyone ever learn that language? Right? How can, do you get, am I making sense? Like if there's a word that can't be translated into English and, and an English speaker will never really understand what it means, how do they learn that word then? Because to learn that word, you need to be told what it means in English so that you can start using it. Anyways, just a, a few things there to think about. I, I, had, I had another example, but the other, the other example I had w w where people go to a foreign language is on the topic of repentance. You know, we don't believe turning from your sins or repenting from your sins is required for salvation. And oftentimes, people that do believe you have to repent of your sins to be saved, they sometimes will go to a foreign language too, because you'll show them verses, you know, where they'll go to verses that say, repent ye and believe the gospel, and then you'll take them to verses like Jonah 3.10 that says, well, God repents, God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger, anger that we perish not. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them and he did it not. And you know what they'll say to you? Well, because in the original language, the repentance that God is doing is a different repentance than man is doing. Have you ever heard them give you that answer? So that's where you're not basing your beliefs on the Bible. You are basing your beliefs on a foreign language and trying to change what the Bible says because of another language. So that's one bad one. A second bad one, bad, so we're talking about bad ways, you know, bad basis for your beliefs as opposed to basing your beliefs on the Bible. The second one I want to talk about is authority. Basing what you believe because of an authoritative source, whether a person or a group or whatnot, other than the scriptures. This is another bad way to base your beliefs. And a lot of people uh, in churches, you know, when you talk to them, you talk to a lot of people, Catholics as well, right? They believe things, why? Because the priest believes it. Even people in independent, fundamental Baptist churches, you ask them, why do you believe things? They just say, well, it's because my pastor believes it, and I just stand with my pastor, right? Now, I get that, right? People tell me that too, that's fine. You know, I, I get, I, I appreciate loyalty in the sense that, you know, people stand with one another, but I never want people to put my words above the word of God. You know, stand with me if I stand with Jesus Christ, but if I don't stand with Jesus Christ, then don't stand with me. Stand with Jesus Christ. So people say like, you know, I stand with my pastor. Yeah, that's, that's good. I appreciate loyalty, but you never want to put my word above God's word. I mean, look at Paul. He says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So why is he beseeching you to follow me? Because he's striving to follow Jesus. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of, of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. So we don't want to just base our beliefs on an authoritative source, whether it's me or somebody else. And you know, another way people do this when you talk to them, they base things on, they talk about the church fathers, yeah. right? The church fathers basing what they believe because that's what all, you know, all the church fathers are, are just bishops that live throughout time. So if you're not going to base what you believe on me, why would you base what you believe on people who have pa pastored churches throughout time? No, we don't just base our beliefs on older Christians, right? We base what we believe on scripture.
Sometimes I tell people, you know, when they go back to the church fathers, I say, like, I have got church fathers too. You know, their names are Peter, Paul, James, Jude, John. These are my church fathers because they were used to speak the word of God and to pen down scripture. This is, our, this is our church father's document. We are orthodox Christians, right? Because we believe on the real church fathers that delivered the word of God, not these Johnny-come-latelys that are trying to change scripture. Amen. A lot of this discussion as well about the orthodox trinity and trinity and all this, people are, people are starting to say things like that. They're starting to say things like, well, who has ever believed this? Right? None of the church fathers. Well, you know, are you going to start believing baptismal regeneration now? Because when you read through, this is, when you talk to a Catholic, you talk to an orthodox, this is how they argue. They say, go back to the church fathers. That's why they believe in baptismal regeneration. That's why they believe in Calvinism. That's why they believe in repentance of sin. That's why when you start going down this road of just reading old writings, you start going down this road of believing in Calvinism, believing in repentance of sin, believing in baptismal regeneration. And don't use that argument. You know, if you're going to argue for the Orthodox Trinity, right? Like argue from scripture. You don't want to argue from church fathers church fathers in history um, what's another one another one is appealing to the majority Ma appealing to the majority you don't want to use this as a basis for your beliefs um, you know i remember uh, at my old church i spoke to a guy once and you know you know because you know how all the, the the baptist churches in australia are pretty much pre-trib right it's, it's hard to find a, a post-trib pre-wrath church and one thing he said to me was th this guy, he said, you know, well, how, how many, yeah, he says, oh, you believe in the pre post-trib pre wrath rapture. He's like, well, how many Baptist people have believed that? And my response was, what does it matter? Yeah. What does it matter how many people believe it? The question is not how many p people believe it, it's does the Bible teach it? You know, because I'm basing what I believe on the Bible, I don't base what I believe on the majority. I mean, if you start going down the road of basing your beliefs on majority, should I be a Muslim? Because, the, because well, Islam is the fastest growing religion, isn't it? Right? You know, should I be a Catholic? Because the Pope's got so many followers. You know, is, is it based on how many followers somebody has? Is it based on how many people believe something? No, you don't base, I don't base what I believe on how many people believe something. I base what I believe on the Bible. Right, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Um, I, I just, I'll just go through these. This is just obviously why we believe that the tribulation happens, uh, that the rapture happens after the tribulation. But this is another example. This is sort of the example I wanted to use because um, when people appeal to majority, you kind of ask the question, well, then, you know, even, even independent Baptists is a minority amongst people that call themselves Christians, right? So there's that. But you know another way people try and base things on majority is they use society or culture. You know, this is why I go to this passage, right? Because people will say, well, you shouldn't wear women's clothes. Women shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Amen and amen, right? Don't put on women's clothes. But then when you ask, start asking the question, well, what are women's clothes? That you have to base from the Bible as well not just the principle of not wearing women's clothes you have to base on the bible what are women's clothes you can't say i believe and base my beliefs on the bible and then go what are women's clothes who thinks a dress is women's clothes ah oh, like so everybody thinks it's women's clothes therefore it's women's clothes that's not an argument from scripture that's not a belief based on the bible this is a belief that is based on society based on culture right because the bible doesn't tell us what the garment is so that's another appeal to a majority, right? So it's not just a number of people, it's like it's society and culture as well, and people use arguments like that. So if you believe something and it's just, well, because everyone does it, everyone believes it, this is not basing your belief on the Bible. Now, what's another one? Another one is association. You know, basing what you believe because you're worried about what it associates you with. Now, where are we gonna draw the line there? Because, you know, if, if I don't wanna believe something based on association, based on what I'm going to be lumped in with, this is why people don't want to refer to the office of a bishop, you know, because they want to refer to it as the office of a pastor, even though I don't believe that's the scriptural office. The Bible says the office of a bishop, but why don't they like that word? Why do they think it's weird? Because it associates them with Catholics. 
Now I get that people think it associates you with Catholics, but is that why I base what I do and what I, what I believe? No, I base what I believe on the scripture. The office is the office, office of a bishop. That's why I believe it, right? Even if there isn't a... Because where am I going to draw the line, right? You know, if I believe in one God, am I going to stop saying that because the Muslims believe in one God? Am I going to stop, you know, going door knocking because the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses go door knocking? You know, am I going to stop, uh, you, know, uh, you know, where does it end, right? People have been accusing me of being a modalist Pentecostal because I believe in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ or I believe in that, I believe that Jesus is the Father, right? But just because they believe that, that doesn't make me any more a modalist or a oneness Pentecostal than people who believe in the Orthodox Trinity are a Catholic, so you can't really make the argument and say, well, you're a oneness Pentecostal because you believe baptizing in the name of Jesus and you believe that, the name of the, um, that, that Jesus is the Father. Well, that doesn't make me any more a oneness Pentecostal than an Orthodox tr Trinity believer is a Catholic, right? So we don't make that argument. I'm not saying that somebody's a Catholic just because they believe that. So it's not just by association. If we base what we believe on association, where does it end? You know, can, can we only believe things now that nobody else has staked a claim on? The way I see it is, like, let's take it back. You know, like, if, if the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are doing more soul winning and more door knocking than us, let's take it back. So then people think, ah, it's the, it's the independent churches, right? It's the Bible-believing churches that are going door knocking, and they're thinking that the Mormon is a Bible-believing person, right? As opposed to, you know, thinking that we're Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. We should take these things back rather than shy away from them if they're based on scripture right if it's based on scripture then let's try and take it back now the last thing i want to talk about uh, I, I did have some scriptures there on obviously why we believe those things um, the last thing i want to talk about is and this is the last bad way of basing what you believe is isolating verses isolating verses if you remember at the beginning we talked about all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, inst instruction in righteousness. So one thing I, I want you guys all to know is, and I talk, I talk about this uh, you know, to Kevin, I talk about this to people that teach the Bible. And people that teach the Bible publicly and have to take a public stand for what they believe in, they understand what I'm about to say. And what I'm about to say is, it is a lot easier to have a verse to base what you believe on than it is to defend that belief from the rest of scripture, if that makes sense. Because people get up and they huff and puff about, I believe, uh, you know, what I believe based on the Bible. And yeah, they probably do have a verse that they use to base what they believe on that, right? But it's a whole nother thing to then defend what you believe about that verse when people come with objections. What about this verse? What about this verse? Explain this verse to me. What about this verse in the Old Testament that we, from a book that you're not familiar with? You know, that is a lot harder than just saying, I believe this because of this one scripture. And then the one example that we all know that we're all familiar with is work salvation, isn't it? Because if you think, I believe in salvation by grace, immediately a verse comes to mind, right? To say, this is why I believe salvation by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Amen and amen. I believe salvation by grace. But what I'm saying is, it's a lot easier to just go, I believe salvation by grace because of that verse, than it is to say, now I'm going to defend salvation by grace when you take me to the parables, when you take me to James 2. I'm going to have an explanation, and you need to have an explanation for all these. Why? Because all scripture is profitable for doctrine. It all needs to fit to that doctrine. If salvation is by grace, then you have to explain why in the Old Testament there is verses that say you need to turn in order you know, to, to find forgiveness and all these things. You need to go to the parables and explain uh, the, uh, you know, why this parable seems to be condemning somebody for not doing works. You need to go to Jesus in the New Testament and say, hey, why did he tell the rich young ruler to sell all he has and give to the poor and then he'll have you know, treasures in heaven? You have to be able to explain all these things, right? So you have to, what I'm saying is you have to take all scripture into account when you believe a doctrine. And that's basing your, so yes, you can base your belief on a single verse, 
but you need to be able to go to James 2, right? And say, well, how do we explain faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? And what do we say to that? Well, you've got to compare that with Romans 4, don't you? What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So when people say, well, you're just isolating verses. No, 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 I can explain James 2. James 2 is your faith before men. Romans 4 is your faith before God, right? So I believe what I believe based on the scripture. But what I'm saying is you need to make sure if something you believe is just based on a verse that you know, you need to test that doctrine to see, hey, does it line up with all scripture? Right, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. And this is how we get sound doctrine. How do we get make sure we're believing the right thing? Because we've rightly divided the word of God. We know the difference between stories and statements and old covenant and new covenant. And then we formulate a position based on clear scripture. And then we need to test it against other scriptures that are also clear to make sure, hey, it's all lining up together. So let's just recap, right? We need to base everything we believe on the Bible, right? Why? Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all scripture is needed to make sure we have the right doctrine, the right reproof, the right correction, the right instruction in righteousness. And it all needs to fit, right? It all needs to fit together to make sure that it is actually right. This is how we test whether it's sound doctrine. But how do people base their beliefs the wrong way? We talked about either basing it on a foreign language, basing it on authority, basing it on the majority, you know, basing it on what it associates you with, or you're basing it on one verse and not all the verses in the Bible, not taking all verses into account. This is how we make sure we base what we believe on the Bible. Anyway, I hope you learned something. I hope it just encourages everyone in here you know, that we, we don't want to believe things just based on what people say. We want to believe things based on the Bible. And that's how I've always, I've always gone about scripture. I've always um, knew that I need to base everything on the Bible. And that's why people, when they look at our church, they think, why, why are some, some things weird? Right? Because I'm trying to get back to the Bible. Right? I'm not trying to just continue a tradition. Right? And that's why when I started this church, we started fresh. That's why the first sermon was, it's a new bottle. We're starting fresh. You know, you want to convince me of something, convince me from the scripture because that's the only thing that's going to make me change. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that we live in a day and age where we have your word and we just pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom um, because, uh, Lord, there's, there's a lot in there and, uh, Lord, there's a lot to know. Um, it's really easy to, to base our beliefs on, on just one or two verses, but Lord, it's, a, it's another thing to defend our faith. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to defend our faith. We'd know the Bible well enough so that we could you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with people that know the Bible sometimes more than us but have false doctrine. So help us, Lord. Help us as a church to grow. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.